Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. In this video, we're going to be discussing the bones of the hand, and we're going to see that we can divide up the bones of the hand into three groups. One are the carpals, which are the most proximal bones. We see those right here, of short bones, kind of irregularly shaped. They almost look like pebbles or rocks that you see at the bottom of a fish tank. In the middle, we have the metacarpals, and then most distally, the phalanges. Perhaps in undergrad, you didn't actually have to know each of these carpals by name, maybe just know how many there were and where they were located. But here we're going to learn a strategy for figuring out what their names are. Now, first of all, with the carpals, the carpals are the most proximal bones of the hand. There's eight of them, and really they make up the wrist. And if we look um, at this region right here, uh, the most proximal part of the carpals, um, they actually articulate with the radius and the ulna. Okay. Now, with these eight bones, we can group them into two rows of four bones. There's a proximal row, and then there's a distal row also with four. Okay. And we're going to first look at the proximal row, and we'll see four bones right here. Now, when we're looking at the bones of the hand and learning them, there's really two things we need to be concerned about. One is whether or not we're looking at a palmar surface of the hand or a dorsal surface. And the reason for that is one of these bones is not visible on the dorsal surface. And so that can actually give us a clue as to which side we're looking at. The other thing we need to pay attention to is how they are named and from what direction. So when we start learning them and when we start naming the metacarpals and so forth and just the digits in general, we always start toward the thumb side. Okay, so when we start naming these, we're going to start on the carpal side closest to the thumb right here. This is the thumb, and this is going to be labeled as digit one. It's just like in the foot where the big toe, or the hallux, was digit one. The thumb, or in this case the pollux, which is what it's called, is digit one. And then as you go toward the pinky, or in this case it's called digit minimi, it's digit five. We always start toward the thumb side. So notice this bone, which is actually metacarpal, this is metacarpal one. All right, when we start naming these bones, we start with the thumb side, and we'll start with the proximal row. So the first bone right here, this is the scaphoid bone. Okay. As we go toward the pinky side, or as we go towards digit five, this one is lunate. And then this one right here is triquetrum. Now, the thing about this is there's this little bone on top of triquetrum, and this one is called the pisiform. Okay. So if we zoom in, just so you can get an idea of what we're talking about, this pisiform, you can see it right here, a little bit smaller. It's actually sitting on top of the triquetrum. Okay. And so that means that when we turn the hand over, we're not going to be able to see pisiform. Okay? So from the thumb side to the pinky side, okay, on the proximal row, we have scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, and then this one right here is the pisiform bone. Okay? Um, if we flip this over to the dorsal aspect, notice we no longer can see the pisiform because it's on the other side of the triquetrum. So again, we can name them from this side, starting at the thumb, scaphoid, lunate, and then this is triquetrum, but we cannot see pisiform. It would be assumed to be on the other side. Because you can't see the pisiform, um, on the dorsal side, um, if you know what you're looking at and you couldn't tell based on the fingers, um, you would know this is the dorsal side of the hand because we can't see pisiform. On this side, we can see pisiform, and so we know that this is the palmar side of the hand. That's the only side where you can see the pisiform. Now, when you're learning these bones, there's an acronym you can use, and you can read it up here. Um, we'll start by looking at the proximal row for the acronym, and it starts off some lovers try positions. Actually, I learned this one from my anatomy teacher in physical therapy school. So scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, some lovers try positions. All right? Again, just realize the pisiform bone you cannot see on the, on the dorsal aspect of the hand. All right, that's your proximal row. Distal row, again, you start at the thumb side nearest digit one. So this bone right here, this is trapezium. Here's trapezoid capitate, and then hamate. And notice here on the palmar surface of hamate, there's this hook right here. Um, this is actually called the hook of hamate, and actually has a clinical significance uh, because the pisiform right here and the hook of the hamate, they stick out palmarly. 
Okay, and so they provide a canal right here, and it turns out that this canal is called the Canal of Gion. Canal of Gion, and it actually provides um, a, a canal for the ulnar nerve to actually get from the forearm into the hand. Okay, so if we were to follow the ulnar nerve, which we'll do in a separate video, it goes between the pisiform and the hook of hamate, kind of right here in this canal that it creates. Okay, now when we look at these, from the thumb side again, in the distal row, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Now, how do you remember which one comes first, trapezium or trapezoid? Well, it turns out they're in alphabetical order. Um, everything's the same up until the I and the O, and I comes before O in the alphabet, I, J, K, L, M, N, O. So trapezium comes first and trapezoid comes next. So we say that they can't handle. And if we put it all together, so we have scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform on top of it, going back over to the thumb side in the distal row, uh, a trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. And so in total, we have some lovers try positions that they can't handle. And that's a little bit dirty there, I know. Uh, but what they say is that the, the dumber or the dirtier the mnemonic is, the easier it is to remember. And this one always stuck with me. So thank you to my instructor. Um, that's the palmar surface of the hand. We can now go to the dorsal side of the hand. And it's really the same thing, except for the fact that we can't, of course, see pisiform. So here's uh, right here, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum with pisiform on the other side, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Again, also, you cannot see the hook of the hamate on the dorsal side either. So really, the hook of the hamate and the pisiform are only visible on the palmar surface. Okay. So again, some lovers try positions that they can't handle it. And when you're looking at these and learning them, remember, as we go across the rows, we always go back and start at the thumb side. And that leads us to talking about the metacarpals. And there is one metacarpal per digit. So there are five total metacarpals per hand. Now, with the carpals, it was just useful to start talking about them on the thumb side, partially because of this mnemonic. But when we start talking about the metacarpals and naming the digits, one through five, we have to start on the thumb side. And just by definition, the thumb is digit one. And the digit minimi, or the pinky, or little digit, is digit five, okay? So this metacarpal would be metacarpal one because it's part of digit one, or the thumb. Metacarpal two, metacarpal three, metacarpal four, and metacarpal five. Now, again, every single digit has one metacarpal. When we go past that, we get to the phalanges. When we look at digits two, three, four, and five, uh, these digits all have three phalanges. So for example, if we look at digit two right here, this phalanx, which is the singular phalanx, this is the proximal phalanx. This one is the middle phalanx, and this is the distal phalanx. Again, there's three of them, so distal, middle, or intermediate, and proximal. And you can do the same thing for digits two through five. What you want to notice, though, is that the pollux, or the thumb, only has two phalanges. There's no middle or intermediate phalanx. There's only a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx, okay? Now, a few more things about the hand. We wanna talk about naming the joints here, okay? Uh, for example, let's take these two bones right here. What are these? Well, this one is in the proximal row of bones. This is between scaphoid and triquetrum. This would be lunate. And this one right here would be capitate in the distal row of, of carpals. So there's a joint between these two carpals. So the joint between these two carpals. And all the joints here that exist between two carpal bones are called intercarpal joints. Now you can get really specific with the names there, really specific. But in general, we just call them intercarpal joints, okay? Now, if we then look at the joints between a carpal bone and a metacarpal, so for example, between the capitate right here and the third metacarpal, then this is called a carpometacarpal joint. And usually when you see this as an abbreviation, it's the CMC joint. If we look at this one on digit one, it's between trapezium and the first metacarpal, this is another carpometacarpal joint. 
And again, generally when we talk about these joints, we just say carpal metacarpal joint one, carpal metacarpal joint two. We don't name them for the bones that are interacting specifically. It's not like the shoulder joint where we call it the glenohumeral joint. If we're talking about the third carpal metacarpal joint, it's already assumed that it's between the capitate and the third metacarpal. Or if it's the fifth me carpal metacarpal joint, it's assumed that it's between the hamate and the fifth metacarpal. So just naming a particular carpal metacarpal joint specifies the bones that are involved. Okay, So again, we could say first carpal metacarpal joint. In any case, then we can talk about the joints between the metacarpals and each of the proximal phalanges. Okay, um, This is called the metacarpophalangeal joint metacarpophalangeal because it's between a metacarpal and a phalanx and the abbreviation that you'll see for that is MCP metacarpophalangeal joint and again we just name those for the digit this one on the thumb would be the first metacarpophalangeal joint the one on the fourth digit the fourth metacarpophalangeal joint okay um, if we go further let's look at digits two through five okay if we look at the joint between the proximal and the intermediate phalanx, this would not just be the interphalangeal joint, because which interphalangeal joint is it? This one specifically is the second proximal interphalangeal joint. This one on the fifth digit, or digit minimi, right here, would be the fifth proximal interphalangeal joint. And that proximal is important because again on digits two through five we also have a distal interphalangeal joint which in each case is between the middle or intermediate phalanx and the distal phalanx. So again on the second digit this one right here would be the second distal interphalangeal joint. All right? If we go to the third digit, again, third distal interphalangeal joint. I think you get the picture there. And that's true. We have those for digits two through five. But with the thumb, notice there's only two phalanges. There's a proximal phalanx right here and a distal phalanx. So do we have to specify proximal and distal with this interphalangeal joint? No, we don't. Not only do we not have to, we can't because there's only one of them. So in the thumb or pollux between the distal and proximal phalanges, this would just be the first interphalangeal joint. Okay. Now, for the types of joints, every one of these in the hand is a synovial joint. Okay? Every one of them is a synovial joint. Um, if we look at the joints between the carpal bones, or intercarpal joints, these are just gliding joints, or plain synovial joints. So all they do are simple gliding movements. There is no rotational movements uh, between the carpals at the intercarpal joints. Then, when we start looking at the carpometacarpal joints, again, the joints between the carpals and the corresponding metacarpals, for digits two through five, they are also plain synovial joints. So again, only gliding movements are possible between the carpals and the metacarpals. However, for the first digit, this carpometacarpal joint, which can be specifically called the trapeziometacarpal joint, this joint is actually a saddle joint. Okay? This is actually a saddle joint. So being a saddle joint, it's going to allow motion in two planes. Um, it's going to allow flexion and extension, and then also um, abduction and adduction. And then also a combination of those movements, circumduction is going to be possible about this joint right here. So this is the first carpal metacarpal joint, also called the trapezio metacarpal joint. Saddle joint here, the rest of these are gliding plane joints. Okay. Now, if we then go to the metacarpophalangeal joints, it doesn't matter which one we're looking at, it's for all of the digits. The joint between the metacarpal and the proximal phalanx, this joint, metacarpophalangeal joint, is a condyloid joint. Condyloid joints are very similar to saddle joints. These joints are going to allow motion in two planes as well. Okay, they're going to allow flexion and extension in the sagittal plane, abduction and adduction, abduction, adduction in the frontal plane, and then also circumduction is going to be allowed about these joints. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And then any interphalangeal joint, it doesn't matter if it's the one interphalangeal joint at the thumb or the proximal or distal interphalangeal joints of the second through fifth digits, these are all 
hinge joints. Okay, so hinge joints, kind of like the elbow, the elbow is the other major example. These are gonna allow just motion in one plane, that is the sagittal plane, and they're gonna be flexion and extension movements. Okay, so just to recap this, intercarpal joints, plane synovial. Carpometacarpal joints of digits two through five, also plane synovial. And then the carpometacarpal joint between the trapezium and the first metacarpal, this CMC joint, is actually a saddle joint. Then if we look at the metacarpal phalangeal joints, all of them, they are condyloid joints. And then all of the interphalangeal joints, the two each in digits two through five, and the one in digit one, these are all hinge joints. So hopefully this comprehensive video of the hand bones give you a good understanding and a good framework to go off of when we start talking about the muscles and the connective tissue and start to fill in a little more details about the hand. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.